And good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 CUBE's virtual seminar series. Typically, we host them in person at the station, and uh, this year we are continuing with virtual seminars uh, bi-weekly. Um, we're really happy to have both Heather and Jesse here today to do their exit seminars for their master's thesis and learn a bit about their research in a short time. Um, I would like to start off with a acknowledgement of the territory. I know people are joining in from different areas, but uh, here in Kingston uh, at Queen's University, we're situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Specifically, the Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center is situated on the unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory, as well as the Cubes campus on Apinacum Lake. And it's part of the Algonquin land claim by Algonquins of Ontario, currently under negotiation with the federal government of Canada. Acknowledgement of these facts requires recognition of the pre-colonial history of this land and the people who, who live here and continue to live here. The cultures and spiritualities of Indigenous peoples are connected to the land and the land is an integral part of their ways of knowing and living. These knowledge systems are continually evolving in relation to the land and its other inhabitants, both human and other than human. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee roots. There is also a significant Métis community and there are First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. Um, and to start off our introductions, uh, first we're going to have Jesse Reynolds, but uh, CUBE's director, Dr. Stephen Lohit, will introduce Jesse and Diane, you're welcome to uh, pitch in if you'd like. Um, Diane Rahel is uh, Jesse's uh, super direct supervisor, but um, Steve, if you wouldn't mind. So it's always exciting to have students giving their exit seminars, and we're very grateful that both Jesse and Heather have chosen the CUBE seminar venue <clears throat> to do this. Um, Jesse is a, an MSc candidate in the Queen's Experimental Ecology and Ecotoxicology Lab, QE3 for short, at Queen's University. She is supervised by Diane Orhel, and she also did her undergraduate degree with Diane. Um, Jesse's favorite ice cream is chocolate with a twist of peanut butter, as I just learned recently. Um, we're excited. Uh, for a number of reasons to, to have Jesse present here, um, not least of which is she's actually spent three summers doing field research at Queen's University. Um, she's also very interested, as you will have seen if you read her bio, in the science, in science communication. And, uh, and it's wonderful to have young people, enthusiastic people learning about science communication as Jesse is. So tonight she's going to talk about her MSc work, The Toxic Effects of Oil Sand Contaminants on Fish. So take it away, Jesse. Thank you so much, Steve, for that introduction. I'm just gonna get a pointer here. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Reynolds, um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about um, my master's thesis research, which was the toxic effects of oil sands contaminants on fish. So just briefly, an overview of my presentation. I'm going to give you some background on my master's thesis uh, research, and then I conducted two different studies to answer my research question, and I'll finish with some conclusions. So most of you have may have heard about the Canadian oil sands region, which is in northeastern Alberta. Canada is actually the third largest producer of oil in the world. Um, the oil sands industry is a major contributor to the Canadian economy, and it supports more than half a million jobs. What you may not know about the Canadian oil sands industry is it actually uses up a lot of fresh water. Um, Canada doesn't just have uh, large reserves of liquid oil. Um, as you might tell from the name, there's a, it's actually a thick, viscous version of oil that's trapped in the sand. And it requires a large amount of fresh water to extract this oil from the sand. Um, in order to reduce the amount of uh, fresh water that's taken from nearby landscapes, oil companies actually recycle fresh water over and over again in the oil extraction process. And they store this uh, water in man-made tailings ponds, um, which you can see in the diagram and are these uh, swimming pool looking things in the picture there. Now, um, being exposed to oil over and over again causes the water to become um, highly contaminated and thus it can be toxic to a variety of organisms such as birds, fish, frogs, 
and plants. Now, because we've been um, extracting oil in the oil sands for decades now, this has caused a large accumulation of this toxic water to be stored in these man-made ponds. Right now, there's enough of this toxic water being stored in Alberta to fill half a million Olympic-sized swimming pools. Or for another analogy, that's the same amount of water that flows over Niagara Falls every five days. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, storing such large volumes of toxic water in an open landscape poses a fairly large liability. You may have seen uh, headlines over the years, such as the ones on the screen, where animals can get caught in the tailings ponds and die in fairly large numbers. The tailing ponds were also not built for long-term storage. Um, and it's recently been confirmed that uh, some of the tailings water has been leaking out of the ponds into surrounding sediments and groundwater. Now that in combination with the fact that oil companies are under contract, um, that once they finish mining the oil sands in a few decades, they have to return the land to the way it was before. Um, and this means that tailings ponds have to be eliminated uh, once uh, oil mining is finished in Alberta. So all of these factors have combined to lead um, both oil companies and the Canadian government to start planning intentional releases of the toxic wastewater into natural environments in order to eliminate tailings ponds. These releases would occur in um, the Athabasca River, which is a major uh, freshwater river in Alberta, which its watershed is highlighted in green here, as you can see. And the releases would occur north of Fort McMurray. These releases may occur as early as next year. The problem that we're facing is that because the water in the tailings ponds is so toxic, it has to be treated before it can really be released into natural environments. But currently, we don't know enough about how the wastewater will affect aquatic species should be released. And specifically, we don't know enough about the lasting sublethal effects that this wastewater might have on aquatic species. Now, sublethal is a term I'll be using throughout my presentation. And by that, I mean the effects that contaminants might have on animals that might not outright kill them, but could have effects on them uh, that would affect their performance and survival later in life. The specific project, a problem that my thesis addresses looks at a chemical family called naphthenic acid fraction components, or NAFCs for short, and you're going to be seeing this acronym throughout my presentation. So NAFCs um, are, end up making the most of the toxic effects that are in uh, the wastewater in tailings ponds. Um, and currently, there are no guidelines for the safe release of NAFCs that are defined with the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment. And this gap in policy has to be filled before wastewater is released into the environment. Um, if we're going to make uh, proper regulations on to how much the wastewater has to be detoxified, um, if we're going to release it in a safe and responsible way. So the objective of my uh, master's thesis was to examine uh, the sublethal effects that these NAFCs can have on fish. And in doing so, I was hoping to help define what concentrations of NAFCs have adverse sublethal effects on fish in order to help inform policy regarding uh, the release of wastewater in Alberta. Now, I conducted two studies to uh, investigate these questions, both of which were done at uh, the Queen's University Biological Station, which I'm very thankful to have done so. The first study was conducted in 2019 with my field partners, Brianna Jackson and Eliza Lopez, as well as Dr. Barry Madison. Um, and they were fantastic field partners and I was honored to work with them. Um, the objective of this first study was to examine the persistent effects that NEFCs have on survival, development, and behavior of early life stages of fish. And by early life stages, I mean fish eggs and recently hatched fixed fish eggs. Um, and the reason I looked at this life stage of fish is because it tends to be the most vulnerable to chemical contaminants. Um, and as well, as you can imagine, fish eggs are not mobile. So if they were um, exposed to a release of wastewater in the environment, they wouldn't be able to swim away, making them very vulnerable to um, chemical exposure. And we hypothesized that um, Early, these early life embryo exposures to NAFCs uh, would affect the fish's ability to survive and develop normally. Um, and we also hypothesized that this impaired development due to the NAFC exposure would have lasting persistent effects on fish uh, later in their life. 
So to test these hypotheses, we took fathead minnows, which is a fish species that's native to the Canadian oil sands region. And we took their fish eggs or embryos and exposed them to a range of NAFC concentrations that were environmentally relevant. And by that, I mean, you could find any of these concentrations in tailings ponds in Alberta. And we did these exposures in our lovely outdoor laboratory, which was this tent. Um, and we did that so that we could take the roof off of the tent during the day um, and fish eggs that were in the jars that you see here and the chemicals would be um, uh, exposed to natural variations in temperature and light. And it was meant to be as natural as an exposure as we could, uh, could do. Um, what we found during these exposures was first of all, that as the concentration of the NAFC exposure increased, the amount of fish eggs that died during the exposure increased as well, as you can see in this curve here. And we found that at about 28 or 30 milligrams per liter, right at the inflection point of this curve, was where about half of the fish eggs died. And we found that any concentrations above that 28 milligrams per liter, almost all the fish eggs died due to exposure. We also found that as the NAFC concentration increased, the amount of fish eggs that were able to survive to hatch decreased significantly. And again, at that 28 or 30 milligrams per liter concentration was where about half the fish eggs were affected and beyond that almost all fish eggs were affected by the chemical exposure. We also very interestingly found that as NAFC concentration increased, um, the heart rate of uh, the recently hatched fish decreased significantly, um, as you can see here. Um, and that's interesting because um, previous studies have found similar findings. And what that essentially um, means is that NAFCs can impact um, a fish's ability to develop a normal heart. And I'll get a bit more into that in a minute. We also found that as the NAFC exposure concentration increased, um, it affected the fish's ability to move as upon hatching. Um, so we looked at fish right as they hatched and put them under a camera and we looked um, at how their bodies moved. Um, and you can see on the lower point of the curve here, fish that weren't exposed to NAFCs had fairly regular body motion that uh, was like a steady state swim. But in these higher uh, concentrations of NAFCs, uh, the fish had a significant increase in twitching events, which would be like a jerky body motion. And and that means that the NAFC exposure um, can affect uh, a fish's ability to move properly upon hatching. We also found that the NAFC exposure significantly affected um, fish malformations at hatch or how the fish were shaped at hatch. So in these pictures you can see here in the top left, this is a normal fathead minnow that had just hatched. These black eyes are, uh, these black dots are its eyes and this is its head. But in the bottom right corner here, you can see a fat head minnow that is severely malformed. And this ball right here is actually a fluid sac that's built up around its heart. And we call that a pericardial edema or a malformation of the heart. And we found that as the NEFC concentration increased, the amount we saw an increase in the amount of these malformations in fish. And we also saw an increase in the severity of these malformations in fish. And what that essentially means, again, is that the NAFCs affect a fish's ability to develop a heart normally. So that corroborated our hypothesis that NAFC exposure affects fish survival and its ability to develop. Now, for a second part of this experiment, we wanted to look at that other hypothesis I mentioned, that if fish uh, development is impaired due to these chemical exposures, will it have lasting effect on fish? So we took the recently hatched fish and moved them into these large outdoor tanks that you can see. And these tanks were filled with fresh water. So the fish were no longer being exposed to NAFCs. Um, and we filled the tanks with natural enrichment from the surrounding environment, like sticks and rocks. And we allowed mosquito larvae to lay their eggs. These tanks were meant to be as natural as possible. And we raised the fish in these tanks for one month uh, to see again, if one month after removal from the chemical exposure, would there still be lasting effects on the fish? And we did indeed find that. So firstly, we found, again, uh, as the embryo NAFC concentration increased, um, the amount of uh, recently hatched larval fish uh, that died 
also increased. So again, these were fish that were no longer being exposed to the chemical. And this is an important finding because um, there have been previous studies that did similar work to that first part of the experiment where they take fish eggs and expose them to NAFCs or other chemicals, and they can pinpoint at what concentrations that fish eggs will die. Um, and they can also say what uh, concentrations that fish eggs will live. But what our finding points towards that even though the fish eggs may live to hatch, it doesn't mean that they're going to live to be a fully developed fish that will survive to a reproductive age. And that's important um, to know while making policy regarding what concentrations of NAFCs can be released to the environment. Now, a second finding we found that's really interesting is that uh, even after one month removal from the NAFC exposure, we found that those exposures affected fish behavior. Um, so in this graph here, these black dots represent um, the number of burst events that we saw in fish when we tested them uh, for behavior changes. And a burst event is basically just a sudden increase in swim speed. Um, and we found that fish that had been exposed uh, to these higher NAFC concentrations had a significant increase in the amount of those burst events that we saw. And we also found a second behavior that changed in fish. And that was uh, the amount of time that fish spent swimming during the behavior trials significantly decreased in fish that had been exposed to these higher NAFC concentrations. Now, what that ends up actually looking like in real life is uh, these fish that were not exposed to the chemical or exposed to really low concentrations of the chemical basically had a normal steady swim. And that could be comparable to someone walking steadily down a street without stopping. But in these fish that had been exposed to the higher NAFC concentrations, they essentially were uh, darting and then freezing, and then darting and freezing. And that could be uh, comparable to someone that would be sprinting really fast and then stopping, and then sprinting fast and stopping. Um, and what that means is that uh, the fish are displaying um, what could be considered an anxiety-like behavior um, due to the chemical exposure one month ago. Um, now, whether or not these changes in behavior actually would affect a fish's ability to survive requires more research. But the fact that um, even after a month removal from the chemical exposure, we're still seeing changes in fish behavior um, is important to note um, and is an important sublethal uh, effect that NAFCs have on fish that hadn't been found before. Um, so in summary, in our first experiment, we found that the embryonic exposure to NAFCs impaired the fish egg survival and development, and this impaired development affected uh, fish uh, survival and behavior in later in life. Now for the second experiment I did, we wanted to further investigate those behavior changes that we saw um, in fish. Uh, and this experiment was conducted last year in 2020, again at the Queens Bio Station, but this time at Warner Lake. And I conducted this study with Sam Jean, who was a fantastic field partner. And I would quickly note we did this experiment um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, which was certainly an interesting experience in itself, but we were both very grateful that we were still able to do field work. Um, so the objective of this second study was to investigate the effects that the NAFCs might have on fish behavior. And specifically, we wanted to look on a fish's ability to avoid a predator, its ability to forage and find food, and it's just regular swim activity. And we hypothesized that the NAFC exposure would impair these behaviors. <clears throat> So to test this hypothesis, we caught uh, yellow perch, juvenile yellow perch from Warner Lake, and we moved them into these large uh, outdoor tanks that you might recognize from the previous study. Uh, and at first we actually took the fish and held them just in clean lake water for a week. And what we did was, um, if you can see in this picture, this is a camera that was over top of the tanks. And we filmed the fish in order to monitor them for just regular swim behavior. And after a week of doing that, we added NAFCs to some of the tanks um, at these two different concentrations, two milligrams per liter and 15 milligrams per liter. And then we held the fish in those tanks for another week, again, filming them for behavior. And in that way, we were able to see if the fish behavior changed before versus after the NAFC addition to the tanks. 
our first finding was actually unexpected, and that was that the NAFC exposure um, impaired survival in the fish. Um, so in this graph here is actually um, just representative of fish uh, from the control group, so fish that were not exposed to chemicals. And as you can see, as um, the day of the experiment uh, on the x-axis um, continues, survival stayed relatively the same across all fish um, in the in the clean water treatment. And at the end of the experiment, their survival remained around 75%. In the first NAFC treatment, which was two milligrams per liter, we saw the same pattern. So after NAFCs were added on day six of the experiment, fish survival still remained relatively the same, and by the end of the experiment was at about 70%. However, in the 15 milligrams per liter NAFC treatment, we saw the significant decrease in fish survival after NAFCs were added on day six of the experiment. So much so that by the end of the experiment, fish in this treatment had an average survival of 25%. And in one of the replicates, you can see none of the fish survived to the end of the experiment. Now, this was surprising to us because as you might remember from that first study, I mentioned that it was at around 28 or 30 milligrams per liter that most fish were affected by the chemical exposure. And we had thought that at half that concentration, 15 milligrams per liter, um, it would be a sublethal concentration and wouldn't outright kill them. We had also thought this because the last study, uh, we used embryos and larvae, which tend to be much more sensitive to chemicals than a juvenile fish would be. So this is an important finding because again, at a fairly low concentration of NEFCs, we still see the significant effect on a fish's ability to survive. And I should mention that um, NAFC concentrations in tailings ponds in Alberta can be upwards of 80 milligrams per liter. So that means that even at these fairly lower concentrations, um, it could still significantly affect fish should they be exposed. Now, uh, an interesting finding was that the NEFC exposure to fish did in fact affect their behavior, specifically in a fish's ability to balance in water. Now, fish normally, as you might know, um, uh, float, float in water or swim in water um, and don't tend to go belly up uh, very often, if at all. Um, and what we found in the fish that ex were exposed to NEFCs, they had a significant increase in the amount of times they went belly up and then righted themselves. Um, so as you can see in this graph here, these black dots represent the average number of times that fish lost their balance during a behavior test. And as you can see in the control fish, both before and after NEFCs were added, fish never lost their balance during a behavioral trial. And the same thing was seen in the two milligram per liter NEFC treatment. Once again, before and after NEFCs were added, fish never lost their balance. In the 15 milligrams per liter treatment, however, Again, before NAFCs were added, fish didn't lose their balance. But afterwards, we saw this significant increase in the amount of times fish lost their balance during the behavior test. Now, as I'm sure you might imagine, um, fish not being able to swim regularly in an environment can have significant impacts on their ability to find food and avoid predators or just perform regular swimming activities needed for survival. So that means that should fish be exposed to these 15 milligram per liter um, NAFCs, um, it could affect their behavior in a way that would affect their survival um, later in life. We also very interestingly found that the NAFC exposure also significantly affects ability, a fish's ability to avoid a predator. So for this test, what we did was we looked um, at fish behavior just normal, uh, just normal before anything was added. And then we added a predator stimulus, which was this fake bird you can see here. We dumped that into the test tank and removed it. And then we filmed fish again uh, for their swim behavior following the addition of a predator. So in control fish, fish that hadn't been exposed to a chemical, after a predator was added to the test tank, we saw um, an increase in um, the distance traveled by fish during uh, the behavior test. And that means that when a predator was added to the tank, fish swam more in order to avoid the predator. And that makes sense, which is we see this increase in these black dots here. But in the both the two milligrams per liter 
and 15 milligrams per liter NAFC treatment, we no longer saw this increase in activity following a predator stimulus. And that means that when fish were exposed to either of the NAFC treatments, their ability to change their behavior in order to avoid a predator was impacted. And that can have, again, significant impacts on a fish's ability to survive should it be exposed to NAFCs. So in summary for our second experiment, exposure to the NAFCs decreased survival in the yellow perch and exposure to NAFCs impaired fish balance while swimming and impaired their ability to uh, avoid predators. So overall, for my master's findings, um, I found that exposure to sublethal concentrations of NEFCs can impair fish survival, impair its fish development, and impair fish behavior, um, both in embryos and uh, juvenile fish. And that means that if wastewater in Alberta is released into natural ecosystems, even after um, the NAFCs have been treated to supposed sublethal concentrations, it could still have effects on fish behavior that may affect their survival later in life. Now, of course, there needs to be future studies to fully understand what um, the lasting impacts that these behavior changes may have on fish. But um, this being the first study that has shown that NAFCs can change fish behavior, this is an important starting point for um, figuring out how to um, manage NAFCs um, in regards to the release. And just overall, my takeaway message is, um, there's no doubt that the water issue in Alberta is a massive and complicated issue. Um, we, the tailings ponds do need to be eliminated eventually, but this will be, require a substantial investment in research, regulations, and environmental monitoring programs um, if we want to release this wastewater in a safe and responsible manner. So there are plenty of people to thank for their help uh, with my entire master's thesis. I would first and foremost like to give a huge thank you to my supervisor, Diane, for her fantastic mentorship over the past three years. I would not be a scientist or where I am today without her, and I'm very thankful. I'm also so happy that I'm able to formally thank all of the staff at the Queen's Biology Station. Um, like mentioned, I, I've spent the past three summers working at CUBES. Uh, some of my favorite memories I've created there and I've made friendships to last a lifetime. So thank you so much for all the support from all the staff. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone in the QE3 lab for being such amazing lab mates and thanks for all your help. I'd also like to recognize that our um, research is funded by Environmental Climate Change Canada, as well as um, the Queen's University Research Fund. Now, <laughs> before I take any questions, I do have a song that I would like to sing for all of you that I wrote about my thesis, if you would let me. Um, I would like to preface by saying I'm not a good singer, I'm very bad at the ukulele, and this is very silly, so please don't take it seriously, but I would like to share with you. <laughs> There's oil in Alberta, but it's trapped in the sand, so they use lots of water to extract it from the land. This water gets quite toxic from touching so much oil. It can kill many animals, and it's leaking in the soil. Right now, this water's stored in some gigantic Toxic water can also 
Shannon to the toxic sludge whether the big fish are small. They could have lasting impacts on their populations that could affect the ecosystem as a whole. Basically what I'm trying to say is that the oil water is quite bad. We need to detoxify it or our fish will be pretty sad. So before the water is released into natural ecosystems, we need to treat it and make it less toxic. We need more water regulation. <laughs> All right, we'll have, we have time for a few questions. You can either just uh, pop them into the chat, or if you wish, just speak up and uh, give up uh, Jesse the opportunity to answer them. I should add, Jesse, that this is being recorded for posterity, so you may well go viral. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Do we have any questions for Jesse? If not, I will ask one. So when you were looking at survivorship <clears throat> in your, your PERT study, um, there was quite remarkable variation, it seemed to me, unless I was misreading your plots in survivorship, even when you had uh, uh, just lake water. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on why there might have been such dramatic variability among your replicates. I think my, my first, I can pull up that plot if that's easier. Um, so yeah, there was variability in the replicates um, and that most likely being because there was about five fish per replicate. So we see example in this replicate, a 50% um, decrease in survival uh, or a 40%, 60% decrease, I should say. And that's would be three fish died in that replicate. Um, and that would probably be most attributed to the uh, large amount of variability that we saw. And then also uh, this study did take place, um, what ended up being in late September. Um, so the temperatures were a little bit colder and the environmental variations could have also affected survivorship across fish. All right, thank you. Other questions for Jesse? There's a, a question in the chat for you. This one is from Ying. Do NAFCs, I don't, I don't know if we pronounce that uh, acronym in some clever way that I'm unaware of, uh, do they exhibit bioaccumulation? In other words, birds that eat fish might have issues later as well? Um, that's a great question. Um, I can't say I've read any studies that have shown bioaccumulation across um, different species levels. Um, but that would be a great follow-up study, um, particularly because uh, OSBW or oil sands wastewater will be released into uh, ecosystems as a whole, and we won't just be looking at one fish species. Um, but unfortunately, I, I don't actually know if there is bioaccumulation of NAFCs. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you so much, Jesse. That was a wonderful seminar. And we're gonna turn over, turn over, it's not the right phrase. Sorry, I had six hours of Zoom meetings today, so I'm a little bit uh, smoked. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna turn the, hand the baton. We'll go with that over to Heather, uh, who I will introduce now. I don't know Heather's favorite ice cream flavor I neglected to ask. Um, but I did note that Heather grew up in the Hammer, one of my favorite cities in Canada, otherwise known as Hamilton, Ontario. Um, and it's a city that houses a rich range of, of uh, species, particularly aquatic species and birds, which is why I knew it so well when I was growing up. 
but is also heavily heavily industrialized, uh, so has experienced a, a, a range of environmental impacts. Heather did her undergraduate degree at the University of Guelph in zoology, reflecting her interest in wildlife and the natural environment. Uh, after moving to Kingston, she became aware of the rich eco uh, ecotoxicological uh, research tradition here at Queen's and that there was an opportunity for her to bring together her interest in assessing wildlife and the environment in her MSc at Queen's University. And this is exactly what she has done, uh, working on a project co-supervised by Drs. Diane Orahel and Vicki Friesen. Um, and uh, Heather's going to talk about her master's work, which is assessing the effectiveness of the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants Using Canadian Herring Gulls. But before I turn it over to Heather, I should also note that Heather, uh, uh, I had the pleasure of spending some time with Heather in the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil just before the lockdown. Um, so Heather was part of our field course in uh, the mountains of, of Sao Paulo state. And uh, I was really impressed with her passion for science and her interest in, in biological diversity. And, and we really did see an awful lot of, of things there. So I guess I would just say thank you for taking the course, Heather, and it was a pleasure to get to know you there. So over thank to you, you Heather. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that introduction, Steve. I'm uh, certainly glad that I had the opportunity to take that course and that we uh, managed to squeeze that in right before total chaos <laughs> ensued. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, I've made a terrible mistake in letting Jesse go first as I regret to inform you all, I did not prepare a song to sing at the end. So my sincerest apologies. But with that, I will dive into my master's work. And that is, as Steve mentioned, trends of flame returns in Canadian herring gall eggs. So I wanna first start talking about the human love affair with chemicals. We surround ourselves with chemicals on a daily basis and they've allowed us to achieve great things in the high quality of life that we know now. And in fact, 95% of manufactured goods rely on chemistry and chemicals. And there's over 350,000 human made chemicals that are registered for use in production around the world. Now, when you think of chemicals in your day to day life, you might think of kind of the obvious detergents, cleaners, those things you grab from under your sink um, every once in a while, but they're also in things like your clothing. Think of dyes and additives, as well as in your food, um, things like preservatives, but also uh, pesticides and fertilizers that allow crops to grow and feed animals. So we have these chemicals, we love them, but inevitably, these chemicals are gonna end up in the environment. And they can do this at a few different stages, starting at the very beginning with their production at chemical plants like this. Uh, this is where chemicals can first enter the environment, uh, usually through kind of evaporation and entering the air. Additionally, products that contain chemicals can end up in our waterways and reach waste um, water treatment facilities where they're concentrated and then released into the water there. Finally, landfills are a huge source of chemicals into the environment where swaths of discarded goods containing chemicals release them into the air, as well as allow them to leach into groundwater. Additionally, either intentional or unintentional burning of this waste further releases chemicals into the environment. Now, these are what we refer to as point sources, essentially the main areas where we're finding these high concentrations of chemicals that are entering the environments and generally speaking, concentrations of chemicals are highest closer to these point sources and then tend to diffuse as you move away. Now there's a very specific group of chemicals that I wanna talk about today. And those are the persistent organic pollutants or POPs. And this is a group of chemicals which has gained international attention due to a variety of negative effects that they have on the environment and human health. So to be considered a POP, there are five criteria that a chemical must meet. First, as the name implies, it has to be persistent. And this essentially means that it resists degradation in the environment, so they aren't really breaking down too quickly and are lingering in the environment for long periods of time. Second, they are organic, and this means that they are carbon-based and contain carbon atoms. This is different from other types of pollution which you might be familiar with, uh, such as heavy metals, for example, mercury, which we consider to be inorganic. 
third, a POP must be able to travel. Um, and it undergoes what we call long range transport through either the atmosphere or ocean currents to reach um, areas far, far away from those point sources. And this is what makes them a global rather than just a local concern. Additionally, they accumulate. Um, so they easily build up in the fatty tissues of organisms and they both bioaccumulate, which means that in the body, they're found at higher concentrations than they are in the environment and biomagnify, meaning that as you move up the food web, you're finding them at higher and higher concentrations as predators are eating contaminated prey. And finally, they are toxic. And this means that they are a threat to the health of wildlife and humans. And there's a huge variety of toxic effects that POPs have, including being carcinogenic, neurotoxic, and affecting behavior, growth, and development. Now within POPs, there is an even more specific group of uh, chemicals, and this is what my project looks at. And these are the flame retardants. Now, the name kind of gives away their purpose and they are used to reduce the flammability of products that they are applied to. And believe it or not, you are completely surrounded by them at this very moment. They are in the computer that you're using to watch this presentation right now. They're probably in the couch or the chair that you're sitting on and they're in the walls of the building that surround you. Now, fear not, they do have a bit of a good side to them being that they reduce that flammability. So if something was to catch fire, you've got a few extra seconds to get out of there. So they've been used worldwide to improve safety standards. But of course, they are POPs, so they do have some of those negative effects. Now, my project looks at two different types of flame retardants. And those are the polybromyl diphenyl ethers, which I'm gonna to refer to more simply as the PBDEs and hexabromocyclodotacane, which I also don't wanna say again, so I'm gonna call it HBCDD. Now, PBDEs have been primarily used for textiles and electronics. And the important thing for you to know about PBDEs is that there's, it's actually a group of 209 different individual chemicals and different combinations and mixtures of these chemicals make up what we call the commercial mixtures. And this will be important in a couple minutes. Um, HBCDD was mainly used for building materials, specifically polystyrene foam for insulation. Now, PBDEs and HBCDD do have similar toxic effects. Um, they are somewhat similar molecules, being that they are bromine based. So they do both pose an increased risk of cancer, disrupt the endocrine system, so they mess with our hormones, um, have neurotoxic effects, and they affect the liver and thyroid. In wildlife, and specifically in birds, they've been found to change behaviors involved with breeding, such as mating calls, and less time incubating eggs, so a lower hatching success rate overall. Now, to give you an idea of just how much of these we're using on an annual basis, um, HBCDD production topped out at about 28,000 tons, which is about two to three transport trucks full of this product every year. Now, that might seem like a lot, but that pales in comparison to the PBDEs, which at their peak reached production around 80 million tons every year. So that's these 25 trucks, but multiply that by 200. Um, and that gives you a total of 5,000 transport trucks per year. Trust me, I was gonna put 5,000 trucks on this slide, but there was no way they were gonna fit. So use your imagination a little bit to multiply this big block by 200. So great. We got these chemicals, we like them, but they're kind of bad for us in getting into the environment. What are we gonna do about them? Well, we're gonna regulate them on an international level and we can do this with the Stockholm Convention. Now the Stockholm Convention is a United Nations environmental program treaty that is specifically aimed at protecting the environment and human health from POPs. And it went into force in 2004 with initially 12 chemicals to be regulated or banned but this is a regularly updated treaty and chemicals are continuously being added. So in 2013, Octa and Penta BDE, which are two of those commercial mixtures that I mentioned before of PBDEs were added. Following this in 2013, HBCDD was added. And in 2017, one final product, uh, DECA BDE that I'm looking at at least was added. All right, fantastic. We've banned them. They're gone? Not quite. We need to make sure that they're gone. And to do this, we use um, herring gulls, specifically the North American herring gull or Laris argentatus smithsonianus. 
Now these guys are great and we've been using them in Canada for monitoring chemicals for over half a century. And one of the reasons they're so great is that we can actually use their eggs for monitoring. Um, as the mother forms the egg, she actually deposits some of the contaminants that are in her body into the egg. And then when she lays that egg, we can measure what's in there and it's very representative of what she has in her body. So instead of trying to wrangle an angry seagull and get a blood or a tissue sample, well, mom's not looking, we steal an egg and she'll never know. Additionally, herring gulls are what we call an indicator species. So they sit at the top of their food web and they do that thing that I mentioned earlier called biomagnification. So the chemicals, as you move up the food web are um, getting higher and higher in their concentration. So not only does this mean it'll be easier to detect in the herring gulls because it's at a higher concentration compared to soil or water or air where concentrations are generally pretty low, but it also shows us what is moving through the food web. Uh, finally, herring gulls are found all over Canada, so we can really easily compare the trends over both space and time. The overall aim of my study is to assess the trends of these flame retardants in Canadian herring gull eggs with respect to the date of their regulation under the Stockholm Convention to see if this regulation is working over both space and time in Canada. So we want to see if and when changes are occurring. We know that trends of some contaminants are not consistent over space and time. So I want to know if the trends of these specific flame retardants share similar patterns across different regions in Canada. My hope is that this research can be used to be assess the effectiveness of the Stockholm Convention in Canadian ecosystems and contribute to a better understanding of its effectiveness on a global scale. So I want to just walk you through the data that I've been playing with over the last year. Um, so we have 18 colonies acro across Canada that are sampled um, by Environment and Climate Change Canada, who provided this data for me. Um, and I have a 12 year period from 2008 to 2019. So that covers when those three chemicals were regulated. We've got two up in the Arctic, a number through the Great Lakes, three going up the St. Lawrence, and then two in the Atlantic as well. And you'll notice that these are color coded and that just corresponds to some of the figures that you're gonna see in just a moment. Now, before I show you the figures, I wanna prepare you for what you're gonna see because it's a bunch of graphs and I don't want anyone to get lost along the way. So all the graphs are gonna look like this with concentration on the y-axis and year on the x-axis. There's gonna be a nice little red line representing the date of addition to the Stockholm Convention. What we're looking for is trend lines. So showing us the change in concentration over time. What we wanna know, is it going up? Is it going down? Is it staying the same? So the black lines will represent the uh, change in concentration on a regional basis. So that was those color coded colonies we just saw. But there's also gonna be dashed or dotted color li or colored lines. And those are the individual colonies. But more importantly than just seeing trends over time, we wanna know, is there a change in these trends? To do this, I used a breakpoint analysis to identify if there's a point in time where the model should change slopes to better fit the data, indicating that a change in concentration is taking place. Finally, last thing to uh, show you before I uh, reveal the data is um, just how they're organized. And these are all composite plots, so a bunch of graphs. I've got all of the Great Lakes stacked on the left, going to, from Superior to Ontario, and then the Arctic, St. Lawrence, and Atlantic on the right. And with that, we will dive in. So this is the first flame retardant that was regulated again in 2009. So you see this red line um, happening in uh, 2009 there. And the first thing to realize about all of these graphs is there's kind of a lot going on. We've got lines everywhere. We've got dots over everywhere. Some are going up, some are going down. What does it all mean? And this is kind of the first main takeaway from this is that the trends over um, space are not uniform and each colony is unique. This is telling us that the birds in each colony are being uh, exposed to different levels of these flame retardants and uh, it's likely influenced by proximity to point sources and potentially differences in the ecology of the birds potentially being a factor as well. So another thing to notice is that for the most part the trends of the, P of the octan pentabdes do start going down eventually, um, but not always. And in fact, in three of our Great Lakes, we see this 
kind of slow increase slow, uh, continuing to happen. Now this could potentially speak to the persistence of these chemicals and that just because we have regulated them doesn't mean that they're suddenly just gonna disappear overnight and it's gonna take a long time for them to actually leave. But what is even more likely culprit is that third BDE product, DECA BDE, that was not regulated until 2017. And you're probably wondering, all right, what does that third product have to do with these other two? Well, DECA BDE, once it enters the environment, actually breaks down into OCTA and PENTA BDEs. So rather than us seeing a continuous input of new OCTA and PENTA BDEs into the environment, what we might be seeing is DECA BDE breaking down, making it seem like there's more OCTA and PENTAs entering the environment. So that explains some of our slow increases happening here. But you'll notice there's a couple places, um, Toronto Harbor being one, this kind of V-shaped line here. We've got a couple increases happening over time here. What the heck is going on there? Why is there suddenly an increase? Well, in the environment, um, chemicals are stored in sediment and they're not really available to wildlife when they're down there kind of tucked away nicely. But sometimes these chemicals can get resuspended um, if the sediment is worked up, uh, particularly during remediation efforts. So that's potentially what we're seeing here is that these big loadings of chemicals stored in the sediment are suddenly being reintroduced and we're seeing this increase happening. So it's gonna take a while for that to start going down as well. Now, we have a bit of a different story happening in the Atlantic and the Arctic, and we actually see a really nice decline happening. And it's potentially because these are farther away from point sources and DECA BDE is less stable in the environment. So it's probably not reaching these areas as readily. So this is kind of good news because it's letting us know that after this date of regulation, we're actually seeing a decrease. Now I'm gonna move on and talk about that other pesky chemical, um, DECA BDE. And we see something a little bit different here. So we're seeing those increases again happening before the regulation occurs. But we actually see this, this uh, change happening before that 2017 date when the regulation took place. So we, for the most part, see decreases after that date, which is great. It's telling us the Stockholm Convention to a degree is doing its job and the chemicals are starting to be removed for the environment. But why is it happening two to three years before the date? Well, the Stockholm Convention works in a way where they don't just sit down and one day decide, all right, we're done with this chemical, it's out. It's actually a several year process where a chemical is first nominated and then there's a couple years of review deciding if the chemical is gonna be listed. So companies knowing that the chemical has been nominated um, will potentially be listed, will stop producing and using this chemical and move on to something else. So that's why we see these changes happening a couple of years before the regulation actually occurs. So this is great because it means that the Stockholm Convention is still working but it's the process of the Stockholm Convention, not necessarily just the regulation itself. And finally, our third one to look at is HBCDD. And we see something similar to uh, DECA BDE being that uh, increase. And then a couple years, in this case, three years before the regulation, we see that decrease happening for almost all of our areas. And again, that's just reflecting that it's the process of the Stockholm Convention that's working uh, very effectively in uh, getting these chemicals, the process of them leaving the environment. One thing to notice though that I'm gonna point out, and I don't know if you noticed in the previous one is that Toronto Harbor is again, doing that little V shape um, in that we actually have an increase happening as well. Now this occurs in for all three of these chemicals and that kind of further supports the idea of there's something going on that's resuspending uh, these chemicals into the environment and they're starting to go up again. Now it's likely that, you know, in a few more years, this will start going down again, but this is why these long-term monitoring programs are so important so that we can keep an eye on these chemicals and figure out um, how, when, and where they're entering the environment. So there's a couple of things I wanna leave you with today. And the first is that the trends of these uh, chemicals over time and space are not the same, but concentrations are generally decreasing after the Stockholm Convention. Now we know there's a couple exceptions to this and we saw, um, and we saw that in the figures, um, 
but we know that for the most part, uh, they are going down. Additionally, changes in concentrations are often earlier than the date of addition, letting us know that it's not the regulation itself, but rather the steps involved um, that are initiating the process of these chemicals being removed from the environment. And finally, there are many other factors at play here, uh, proximity to point sources, uh, long range transport, resuspension of these sediments and potentially even individual changes in the bird's ecology. Now there's a huge number of people to thank for this, uh, particularly my two supervisors, Diane Orahill and Vicki Friesen, um, who have been incredibly supportive uh, during all the craziness that has been COVID-19 and doing a master's during it. Uh, my wonderful committee members, Jennifer Provence and Stephen Lougheed, and my, um, my Environment and Climate Change Canada collaborators who entrusted me with this data and have guided me along the way. Um, Dr. Shane DeSola, Kim Hughes, Dr. Robert Letcher, Pam Martin. And of course, I wouldn't be here still holding on to some sanity during COVID without my uh, lab members from both the QE3 and Friesen labs. So with this, I will leave you with this lovely picture of a herring gull, which is what you probably recognize them as, the pesky seagulls trying to steal your food. And I will happily take any questions. Thank you very much, Heather. Wonderful seminar. Uh, as before, if you have a question for Heather, just uh, you can either raise your hand or you can just pop your video on and ask it or pop it into the chat. And remember, this is an exit seminar, so you show your appreciation by asking engaging questions of Heather. Well, I'm going to ask a pesky outlier to, uh, talk or a question, and you already, I think I probably asked this in, in your committee meeting, but I think it's Great Slave Lake. Uh, I'm trying to remember which of the flame retardants it was, but there was one point that was just off the charts. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if you have an explanation for that. I'm, and yeah. I'm, and, and it's Great Slave Lake. I'm, I'm curious because I know there are a bunch of mines that they're decommissioning around there too. I'm just, I don't know if there's a, a tie in there at all. Yeah, you make a great point there, Steve. And um, the outliers is something that's kind of been a bit of an ongoing debate for me, um, being that each data point is so valuable and, and tells us something. Um, but that Great Slave Lake data point, um, I know exactly what you're talking about, that one that almost reverses the trend um, and you're exactly right, is that in the Arctic, uh, that particular site is actually a lot closer to urban sources and potentially point sources uh, than the other Arctic site, the East Bay Bird Sanctuary. So it's very likely that there could have been a spike one year due to possible incineration of waste, as you mentioned, decommissioning of the mines. So um, I think it is, you know, kind of a real data point that's reflecting a spike that year. Um, but unfortunately, we do have kind of that limited time frame with the Arctic data. So it's hard to know if that's a single spike in that year or if it's a trend coming down over a long period of time. And again, this kind of speaks to the importance of um, these long term monitoring programs and being able to track this um, over a long period of time. So general conclusion is um, I think it's something that was happening that year. Um, perhaps the birds were acting differently as well, changing their feeding strategy. Um, this is something that I'm currently working through uh, figuring out as well using uh, stable isotopes. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, here's a question in the chat for you. Sorry, I'm exhibiting my blindness here. <laughs> Uh, do the chemical companies that decommission certain chemicals simply make slightly modified versions to escape the Stockholm Convention? Clever chemical companies. <laughs> uh, the short answer is, is yes. Um, a lot of these chemicals are very similar. Um, and in fact, when a chemical is being listed under the Stockholm Convention, the Stockholm Convention will actually suggest alternatives. The alternatives are often very similar, only differing in a couple of atoms. So. Yeah, <laughs> basically one gets regulated, they switch to something else, and then a number of years later, 
that chemical ends up getting regulated as well. And HBCDD was actually suggested as a replacement for some of the PVDE products. And as you saw, ended up getting regulated. Thank you. Two more questions in the chat from Tim. Does the ecology of the birds differ among sites? Um, another really good question. And there are big differences in these birds across the country. Um, just looking at migration of the birds, we see huge differences. Uh, the birds in the Great Lakes, for example, kind of sit around and loaf in the Great Lakes area all year round. Um, whereas the Atlantic birds are doing a short migration down to the coast of the United States. And the Arctic birds uh, really like flying apparently and they go all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. So that in itself, as well as um, some feeding differences, um, definitely we're seeing um, differences between the colonies and what um, kind of chemical concentrations they would be exposed to as a result of that. Thank you. One final question, I think, and then we'll let you off the hook and uh, you can go have a pleasant tea or a mate as they would have a uh, drink in southern Brazil. Um, how are chemicals nominated for regulation under this act and who does the nomination? That's from um, Hayden. Another, Hayden. Yeah, it's another really good question. Um, so the Stockholm Convention has a bunch of different countries who have signed it. And of course, within each country, they kind of do their own risk assessments on a regular basis um, and are constantly monitoring for new chemicals. So um, I think in the case of HBCDD, it was actually Norway that uh, had done a risk assessment, realized that it was a problem and ended up uh, nominating it to the Stockholm Convention. So it's kind of the signing parties of the convention that uh, initiate the process. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we should let Heather off the hook. Um, I'd like to thank both Jesse and Heather for wonderful exit seminars. We really appreciate you contributing to the uh, to the CUBE's virtual seminar series. So thank you again. And perhaps we can show our appreciation with clapping and whatever that noise maker is and the reactions there. I just, uh, there, that's what it is. Is it a party hat? That's a party hat for the two of you. I don't know what it is. <laughs> anyway, thanks again. And thanks everyone for coming to our seminar. Appreciate it very much. Bye guys. Thank <laughs> you.